Imam Hassan al-Basri rahimahullah, he says, there are three people, they don't get the protection of backbiting. Fasiqun, mu'linul fisq. Someone who's a corrupt person and they're open about it. So this is where someone's like, I'm gay and I'm proud. Well, <laughs> you put it on social media and TikTok and whatever else and the whole world knows, at that moment, the protection of backbiting is gone. So be careful about going public with your sins. Well, Amir al-Jair, a corrupt leader, which is basically the entire Middle East right now. And wasahibul bid'a, someone who's an open heretic in their religion. They have some radical, perverse views of their religion. Then you can talk about that person. So, if you remember last week, we focused on just one phrase of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, where the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "Wa Allahu al-haraj," that Allah has removed any suffocating difficulty from this religion. And if you all recall the context of the Prophet saying that was Usama says radiallahu anhu that the Prophet got like surrounded by Bedouins and they started kind of peppering questions at him. And Usama's like, I could tell that the questions that they're asking, they think it's a big deal, but really in the religion is not that big of a deal. So the Prophet after a while said what he said, he's like, Ibadullah or servants of God, God would not put any undue difficulty upon you. He has lifted that from this religion. And then the Prophet ﷺ continues on with his statement. So now, remember the phrase, Wada Allah al Allah has removed any undue difficulty from this religion. And then the Prophet said, accept. Here we go. He says, accept for a particular person, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Prophet said, Allah has removed difficulty from this religion except for one type of individual who, now I'm going to give you the literal translation, Except for someone who cuts off a piece of flesh off of someone else, that person will be in grave difficulty and destruction. Now what on earth does that mean to cut off a piece of flesh off of someone? To take a part of someone. Our scholars here, they say the Prophet is actually referring to backbiting. Because remember the analogy in the Quran that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us? It's a graphic analogy of cannibalism, which we'll inshallah talk about today. That analogy of the Quran is what the Prophet is alluding to, that you backbiting someone, taking a piece of their reputation, is like cutting physically something off of them. And that reference to backbiting is basically the topic today. You guys, I really want to spend a little bit of time talking about backbiting and ghibah. Because for real, uh, it's crazy how casually people backbite. It just rolls off their tongues and not a care or concern in the world when they are backbiting. I'll share with you a personal story. <clears throat> I had a chance to visit a business. I'm purposefully being generic because I don't want any uh, unnecessary hate mail coming after me. Anyway, I visited this business. I walked through the lobby. I'm at the front desk. And at the front desk are two ladies who are talking to each other. And they serve what you can say like an HR role. And this scenario that I'm giving, as generic as it is, it can apply to a school, to a business, whatever. Two ladies are sitting at the front desk. They tend to deal with employees. And now they're talking to each other. And I'm just sitting, minding my business, but I'm overhearing what they're talking about. And they're like, that guy was so rude to me. He thinks he can just come in late whenever he wants. And it's an all-out venting sesh. All out. And they're talking to each other and they're going off. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, do you know how much ghibah you just did? Do you know it's a major sin? And this was a Muslim business. So it's not like, you know, it's just Jessica and Patricia talking to each other. These are Muslims talking to each other. And there's ghibah happening. There's backbiting session happening. And it almost seems like they're not even aware. That's the sad part. So I wanted to raise some awareness today because Hassan al-Basri, rahimahullah, he says, Wallahi, lal ghibatu asra'u fi deeni rajul min al-akhalati fil jasad. He's like, he's like, by Allah, ghiba and backbiting is more destructive to your religion than a deadly virus is to the body. It burns through your good deeds. It pollutes your soul. So I think we owe to ourselves, inshallah, inshallah, to understand what backbiting is, to inshallah start training ourselves to detect it, that inshallah, inshallah, we become aware. I hope by the time our session today is over, you guys are like ghiba experts. Not experts at doing it, but detecting it, inshallah. Ameen, ya Rabbil Alameen. And folks, let me just tell you, no one's safe. Like a couple of brothers, every time I start talking about backbiting, they bring out their phone, they're like, man, let me record it for my wife. You know, my mama really got to hear this. And, and <laughs> I'm telling you, no one's safe. Recently, I found myself in a situation, subhanAllah, man, it creeps up on you. 
So I'm talking to my relatives overseas and I'm talking to my aunt and I'm like, you know, how are things? It's been a, it's been a minute since I've kind of caught up with her. And uh, she lives in a larger family. So she lives with her in-laws. So I'm like, how's family doing? How are in-laws? Of course, you know, you gotta ask. And she kind of started to kind of open up. She's like, she started talking to me about all the expectations that are upon her and how numerous they are. And I'm kind of feeling bad for her and I'm validating some of our feelings. And as she saw that she's being validated, she started to open up a little bit more. Where are the expectations coming from? How much of that's coming from the mother-in-law and the father-in-law is getting real specific, real quick. And I'm feeling outraged for my aunt that how much is being thrown at her. And I'm, then I caught myself, I'm like, dude, this is all out backbiting happening right now. And I'm in the middle of it, perhaps even facilitating it. That's crazy. That's how rapidly you can find yourself in those types of situations. So knowledge is power and we're gonna learn, we're gonna utilize that power today, inshallah. So let me begin by defining backbiting for you. The Arabic word, as you know, is ghiba comes from the root of ghaib. What does ghaib mean, folks? As we typically translate as the unseen. Well, another meaning of ghaib is when someone is not in front of you. When someone is absent or in absentia, they're not physically there, they say they are in the ghaib. So, if you understood this, ghiba then, the technical definition of ghiba is, ghiba is when you're talking about someone who's not present, ghaib, in a manner that they would dislike. Let me say that one more time. Ghiba or backbiting is when you are talking about an individual, you're mentioning them, and you're not saying the most positive things about them, and they are not there. If you understood this, then I want you to know that these are, this is not my definition. I didn't just cook it up in my head. Awesome gives you an explicit definition in your face. This definition comes straight from Sahib al-Wahi, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, where hadith comes in Abu Dawood and Tirmidhi, he was asked, point blank, Ya Rasulullah, ma al-ghiba? What is ghiba, Ya Rasulullah? And our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam beautifully, succinctly captured it in four words or so. He says, ghiba, dhikruka, akhaka, bima yakram. Ghiba is when you mention when you discuss someone not present, which is implied in the word ghiba, when you mention someone not present in a manner that they would hate, that they would not find it to be pleasant. So Sahaba, when they heard this, they asked a very intelligent question. They're like, Ya Rasulullah, what if it's true what we're saying about them? Like, what if it's factually accurate that that person's breath really does stink? And they are kind of goofy and annoying. Like, we're actually telling you their behavior on the ground. You know what the Prophet said? He said, if it's factually accurate, that is ghiba. If it's not factually accurate, that's bhutan, which is even a greater sin. Let that sink in for a second. And now you may be wondering why. Why is it that if someone has, let's say, a strong body odor, and, not, and you mention it to someone else um, when that person is not there, why is that a big deal? Why is, is that considered ghiba? The answer is, our scholars, they say, because when you're talking about someone who's not physically there, and you're talking negatively about them, they are not there to defend themselves. So in a way, you're the one spinning the narrative, you're highlighting certain facts, and you are in a way judge, jury, and the witness all by yourself. And people just get to hear, or a person who you're talking to gets to hear just one side of the story, there's no context, there's no larger personality to contextualize that particular fact or trait in. And we know through social media experimentations, y'all, how vicious people become when they're talking about someone who's not physically in front of them. The psychopathic tendencies that come out on Twitter, it's, it's not a coincidence, it's because the person's not physically in front of you, so you, you say certain things, you'll exaggerate, you know? The type of capping that occurs, you will not see it when the person is right in front of you. So if you understood this, <clears throat> then you appreciate the fact that this definition of the Prophet ﷺ that he gave you, talking about someone in their absentia, in a manner that they, don't, they wouldn't like, this cuts through all the noise. Because you know, oftentimes when you talk about backbiting or you call someone out, they're like, yo, Abdullah, bro, cut it out. That's backbiting. He's like, yeah, I can say it to his face. You guys heard of that one, right? You know how I respond to that? I say, well, if you have the guts to say to their face, maybe you should, because that would be front biting. At least a person can defend themselves. At least they can give the other side of the story. And you're not the only one putting a top spin on whatever the situation was. That's actually better. As long as, of course, the situation doesn't escalate and things don't get physical. 
Front biting is better than back biting. The person can give their perspective. Problem with back biting is they're not there. And my dear brothers and sisters, in a hadith in Targhib uh, al-Tarheeb of Imam Mundhiri, we get additional clarity on back biting. So the Prophet was sitting with his companions when someone started to make comments about someone else who was not there. And they're like, Ya Rasulullah, this person we know, they're so full of themselves. They don't eat until they're fed and they don't ride until they're driven. Yeah. And they just lay out the facts. And the Prophet immediately called it out. He's like, that's backbiting, watch it. So Sahaba, they started to defend themselves. They're like, Ya Rasulullah, what, we, what we're telling you is what we observed. Like this is the objective behavior on the ground. We didn't like, like put masala and spice on it. This is what we observed and we're just reporting to you. The Prophet also says once again, suffices for it to be called ghiba even if you're telling the truth. Why? Because at the heart of the problem, the issue is the person is not there. They cannot defend themselves. And you guys, now we come to the analogy of the Quran. This is why Allah gives a graphic analogy in the Quran. What does he say? أَيُحِبُّ أَحَدُكُمْ أَن يَأْكُلَ لَحْمَ أَخِيهِ مَيْتًا فَكَرِهْتُمُ وَاتَّهُ اللَّهِ Allah says in the Quran, describing backbiting, after he's telling you, وَلَا يَغْتَبْ بَعْضُكُمْ بَعْضَ Do not backbite each other. Then he says, would, would any of you like to consume the dead flesh of his brother? No, you would be disgusted. Then what taqullah? Then have taqwa of Allah. Our scholars, they say, why compare backbiting to cannibalism? It's crazy. And not just any cannibalism. You're eating rotting carcass, and not just any dead flesh of your brother. Our scholars, they say the reason Allah makes this analogy is because when you cannibalize someone's reputation, figuratively, Allah analogizes it literally. And number two, just like a dead body is, is unable to defend itself, that brother you're backbiting is not there to defend themselves. And that's the issue with backbiting. And my dear brothers and sisters, our Prophet would use this analogy of eating dead flesh often. So in one narration, man, I was shocked when I came across this. Listen to this. Narration comes in Abd ibn Habid's collection. Ikrimah says that the Prophet ﷺ met a group of people and he told them to floss. Just, just wrap your head up. He's like, Takhallim. Prophet met a group of people and he's like, you need to floss. They're like, Ya Rasulullah, we haven't ate anything since yesterday. And in the middle of the day, the Prophet was like, y'all need to floss. Because you know, there are bits of pieces that typically get stuck in your teeth. Oh, I was like, Takhallalu, you need to floss. They're like, Ya Rasulullah, but we haven't had anything to eat. The Prophet said, actually, inni ara, I see bits of flesh stuck in your teeth. Because y'all were backbiting. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Inni ara lahma fulanin. I see the flesh of someone stuck in your teeth. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And what the Prophet is describing here, this happens at parties all the time. There are people sitting together having food, and then one person gets up to get, get the seconds, and everybody else behind them, they start making comments. As if there wasn't enough meat on the table, they have to add the flesh of their brother, you know? And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us aware of this reality. And can I just bring your attention to the fact that sometimes people do backbiting in a kind of slick manner? So they're a little slick with the way they backbite because you know, they'll backbite with their gestures or their facial expressions or even with a positive statement. So you know, you'll hear brothers, because you know, brothers tend to be a bit more discreet and low-key about how they backbite. So like, you know, you're, like, you're talking about your buddy Abdullah and how you're hanging out with Abdullah and the other brother says, you're like, Abdullah? And that guy, astaghfirullah. Bro, I don't want to backbite or anything like that, so I'll just stop right here. So you already backbit and you manage to do it with astaghfirullah. Only a devout Muslim like that would do something like this. This is, the, this is a sad situation. At the time of the Prophet ﷺ, hadith comes in Tabrani, that a lady entered upon the Prophet ﷺ, and Aisha radiallahu seen she wasn't the biggest fan of that person. And uh, after the person left, the Pro Aisha kind of gestured to the Prophet ﷺ about her height, signaling that she's kind of short. The Prophet ﷺ immediately is like, you just back then. Careful. Careful. And this is the awareness we have to raise in our body language, in what comes out of our mouth, and how we get carried away. Might I remind you folks, and if nothing has impressed upon the importance of backbiting in your heart, hopefully this will. Might I remind you that backbiting is not just a minor sin. 
according to many scholars, it's a major sin. Now, where do they get this from? Famous hadith of the Prophet towards the end of his life. I want you to just be in awe of how the Prophet sets up this hadith. Hadith comes in Bukhari and other collections that towards the end of the life of the Prophet during the farewell pilgrimage, the Prophet is with his companions and as they are going through the rites of Hajj on the 10th day of Hajj, the Prophet addresses his companions and he says, What day do you think today is? And Sahaba are quiet, thinking that the Prophet is about to rename this particular day so they don't want to say anything. And then he says, Isn't this the 10th day? The day of sacrifice? They said, Bala ya Rasulullah. They're like, Of course, Ya Rasulullah. And then the Prophet said, Wa ayyu shahrikum hada? And what, what month is this? And once again, that's how are quiet. And the Prophet said, Isn't this the, the month of Dhul Hijjah, the sacred month of Hajj, which is known as Dhul Hijjah? They're like, Bala ya Rasulullah. And now the Prophet, after having summoned the sacredness and the importance of the day of Nahr, the 10th day, and the, the month of Hajj, and of course the location of Hajj, which is the Haram. After that being at the forefront of their mind, the Prophet drops the hammer. He says, فَإِنَّ دِمَاءَكُمْ وَأَمْوَالَكُمْ وَأَعْرَاضَكُمْ بَيْنَكُمْ حَرَامْ كَحُرْمَةِ يَوْمِكُمْ هَذَا فِي شَهْرِكُمْ هَذَا فِي بَلَدِكُمْ هَذَا The Prophet said, having understood the, the sacredness of this day, in this month, in this location, allow me to tell you that your blood, your property, and your reputations are haram upon each other, sacred upon each other as the sacredness of this day, and this month, and this location. Ibn Hajar rahimahullah, he says, when you violate someone's blood, that's called murder. When you violate someone's property, that's called theft. And when you violate someone's reputation, that's called backbiting. All three, the Prophet put them at the same level, at the same pedestal, effectively signaling that's a major sin. Let that sink in. Let that marinate in your hearts and mind. Now, my dear brothers and sisters, when we talk about backbiting, one question I often get is, are there any cases in which you can speak negatively about someone? There's bound to be some cases, and the answer is yes. There are actually five cases in which backbiting is permissible to the extent needed. They say in Arabic, Dire circumstances, they permit certain things to the extent necessary. So, what are some cases in which you are allowed to backbite or talk negatively about someone? Let's go through them quickly. Number one, in cases of oppression. So, if you are in a situation where you are being oppressed, or your rights are being violated, or you have observed that someone else's rights are being violated, you can cooperate with the authorities, you can bring up names, you can be a witness in the court, and if you're someone as a witness in the court because you saw a crime taking place, and you're like, sorry, I can't, I can't be able to, I can't back by, my religion says I can't back by, mm -mm. in that situation, it is permissible for you to say whatever you have to say. So that is of course the first exception to backbiting. Number two, when you're talking to someone who can help change a negative situation. When you're talking to someone who can help change the situation. So imagine um, in the hallways of Islam school, I hear some kid cussing. And you know, like first time I let it go, the second, third time I kind of overheard him and he was kind of far away so I couldn't just like, you know, beeline and just like put him in his place or whatever, right? Couldn't give him a smack down. So now when the parent-teacher conference came around, I was like, you know what? Let me bring it up to his father. Can I do that? The answer is yes, because his father is in a position to help. And of course, my intention shouldn't be like, man, well, I need to channel my resent resentment somewhere. No, no, no. Of course, my intention is I need to fix this situation, and the father is in a position to help. And therefore, it's okay for you to open up. You know how they say in school, snitches get stitches, right? Well, it's not always true. If you're talking to a teacher, you saw something shady go down, like there was a fight that broke out, let's just say, in the activity area, and now you go up to the teacher and you're like, man, I don't know if I should backbite my friends. No, 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 you're talking to the authorities, you can open up. That is actually a permitted exception to the rule. Similarly, if you see an employee and you observe gross negligence, and you alert the people in charge in that situation, inshallah, that would be, um, that would be an exception to the rule of backbiting. The third situation in which you're allowed to backbite is when you're seeking a religious verdict. So you go up to an imam, and uh, unfortunately you have to reveal certain facts about your family and members of your family to seek help, then in that situation, 
are scholars that say it's okay for you to open up to the extent necessary. Doesn't mean you throw the entire kitchen sink at them. No, 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 you open up to the degree possible. So for instance, if someone was deprived of their inheritance and the siblings, they just all colluded and they're like, they excluded this particular person, then you would open up to the imam that my siblings did me dirty or astaghfirullah, may Allah protect. If someone is in an abusive relationship, then you can open up to the imam, open up to your counselor because you're talking to someone who is in that position. Number four, <clears throat> and this one comes up probably the most. So this one you need to know uh, very clearly. And that is when you are in a position to protect someone from harm. If you are in a position to protect someone from the harm of another person, you should speak. So imagine someone is about to get into a business partnership with uh, person A. And that person A, well, you did business with them or you know they're shady and you know they're, they rip people off. Now you can alert and inform the person who's about to start the partnership. They're like, yo, I've been down that road, don't go. Divulge enough information that the person becomes aware. Once again, you don't, you don't want to open the Pandora's box. Pour your entire heart out. No, let them know and make them aware of the harm that's about to happen. Or if someone comes up to you and they're looking for someone's hand in marriage for their daughter. And as an imam, this happens all the time. What do you think of this person? As an imam, if I know some serious character flaws, I will have to open up to the extent needed. We're selective, we're conservative, but we gotta do what we gotta do. And then finally, my dear brothers and sisters, <clears throat> very interestingly, the fifth exception to backbiting is if you're talking about someone who's an open sinner and criminal. If someone is already known to be a sinner or a criminal, you can talk about them and that is not considered backbiting. So probably the most extreme case of this would be like the Jeffrey Epstein's of this world or the Harvey Weinstein's of this world or any well-known individual, for instance, it's well-known in our community who runs liquor stores or someone who's openly corrupt. And that reputation has been, has become widespread because of their own actions. And they're not exactly shy of telling people about their lifestyle. Then Imam Hassan al-Basri, rahimahullah, he says, uh, there are three people, they don't get the protection of backbiting. Someone who's a corrupt person and they're open about it. So this is where someone's like, I'm gay and I'm proud. Well, <laughs> you put it on social media and TikTok and whatever else and the whole world knows at that moment, the protection of backbiting is gone. So be careful about going public with your sins. Well, Amirul Jail, a corrupt leader, which is basically the entire Middle East right now. In that situation, again, if you're talking about corruption of a leader, there's permissibility there. And وَصَاحِبُ الْبِدْعَةِ الْمُعْلِنِ الْبِدْعَةِ Someone who's an open heretic in their religion. They have some radical, perverse views of their religion. Then you can talk about that person. So if you understood all of this, these are the five exceptions to backbiting. Now, <clears throat> I I'd like to give you a quick case study because I cannot just give you the theory and not give you not give you the opportunity to see that theory in action. I want you to imagine, and I actually got this question on our hotline. Someone asked, sometimes I vent to my friends because of the trauma that I've gone through or the abuse that I am going through. So can I just vent to my friends about, let's say what my family is doing to me or my, what my best friend did to me? Can I do that? And the answer to that question is, you have a couple options here. If you want to start that venting session, number one, it has to be kept anonymous. The person we're talking to cannot trace the identity in any shape or form to the person you're talking about. And this is really, really critical because if the person knows your family and you're like, you know my siblings, what are my siblings? They have a very good chance of triangulating who you're talking about. Too close for comfort. So either you keep it anonymous and then vent. You can say for instance, someone in the community and you are reasonably sure that that person will not be able to once again home in on that person. The second option you have is you can only vent to someone who is once again in a position to help change the negative situation or you're cooperating with the authorities. If your friend is not in a position to help, they're not a counselor, they're not an imam, they're not some authority figure that can intervene and heal, then that situation they're not the person you would vent to, that would be backbiting. And finally, the third option is you really want to vent, vent to God. That's what prayer is for. It's supposed to be a therapeutic session. But what did your prophet did after what happened to him in Taif? Allahumma inni ashku ilayka dharfa quwwati wa qinna tahilati wa hawani ala nas Yo, he's pouring his heart out to God and, and it's actually supposed to heal you and many people tell us when they do dua properly what it does to their psyche so vent to God if you must 
And um, I'd like to end our session today <clears throat> by reminding you of your responsibility when it comes to backbiting. You guys, if you're in a situation where someone is being backbit, what are you supposed to do? Allah says, تَحْسَبُونَهُ وَهِيِّنَا You may think it's a small deal. وَهُوَ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ عَظِيمٌ But it's a big deal to God. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that when you are observing backbiting happening in front of you, مَا يَكُونُ لَنَا أَن نَتَكَلَّمَ بِهَذَا You have to intervene. In a gentle, perhaps firm, whatever the situation demands, you need to change the topic. You have to let people know it's not appropriate to go down this road. Guys, we can't be backbiting. If you have like a lighthearted comment, you're like, yo, I got enough sins, man, let me don't, let me, let's not add more. Whatever you have to do, change the conversation. If you cannot change the conversation, you leave the gathering. Number two, another option, if backbiting is happening, you either catch yourself or you catch someone else, particularly if you're, if you're in a WhatsApp group and people are throwing dirt and throwing shade or whatever, what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to defend the person. There's a narration actually on that front. It comes from Anas radiallahu anh, that إِذَا وُقِيَا فِي الرَّجُلِ If someone is taking shots at someone, then you need to be their defender and lawyer. Because they are not there to defend themselves. In one narration, Allah will assign you an angel that will defend you. So, that's another responsibility you have. Now, <clears throat> if you're in a situation where you're the one who backbit, and the hopefully now remorse is kicking in, and now you've caught yourself, what are you supposed to do in that situation? First thing, you make istighfar for yourself, and then you ask Allah's forgiveness for that person. So in a way, you damage them, and now you're making them whole by asking Allah to forgive their overall sins. Not that they committed the sin, please don't misunderstand. You're making istighfar for them as an added service, because now you want to be a source of benefit, because you were a source of harm earlier. Now, should you confess to that person that you backbit? Here are scholars that say, if the situation will become such, your friendship would be over, or that family relationship would be over, then don't tell the person, but speak positively about them in similar gatherings to the ones you did backbiting in. And that's the way you balance the debits and the credits. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make his people who are detectives of subhanahu wa ta'ala,